make a start. So this is what the faithful remnant looks like. <laughs> well, well done for making it to the last session. Let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together and we commit our time to you. Even though we are not at a church service, we are believers who have gathered together to look and see what you have done in our land and tonight also to reflect on what you would have us do looking to the future. So we pray that you would bless our time together. Thank you for those who are online. We pray that you would bless them as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the last session, and there we have it, session five, where we're going to be looking at revival, summary lessons, a bit of positioning, the role of Hillcrest Baptist in our land, and tonight is also going to be then some time for questions and answers and comments. I do have a roving mic which Jamie will hand around. Um, so I'm aiming to have about 30 or 40 minutes of presentation um, and then to allow comments, insights. If there are none, then we'll end early. Um, and also, I'm probably going to forget near the end, I must just express my thanks then. Whenever we run a seminary cafe, there's hard work in the background. Um, to Mindy, who helped with the slides and organization, Frankie for security and keeping our car safe, uh, Jonathan on sound and projection, and to all of you, um, thank you for attending. Okay, last week we had a query about the Church of Christ. So what is the Church of Christ? I uh, did some research, and here's a quick few slides, just overview. As far as I can gather, and I did quite a bit of research, is they would, the Church of Christ would be what we would call a conservative Protestant church grouping. There are some founders, um, Stone, Campbell, and Campbell. They were initially Presbyterians in the USA. Their grouping started out being called the Disciples of Christ in the 19th century, um, and then they were they listed the church actually as the Church of Christ. Um, and essentially what formed the, the influence for this Church of Christ was what they'd call the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement. What that means, or what their distinctives are, are as follows. They teach the Bible only with no additional creeds or statements of faith, so they would be anti even a confession of faith. They wouldn't have anything written down, really. They, a, the aim is to restore New Testament Christianity. And what they mean by that is pre-denominational Christianity. Before you had the church councils, denominations forming, they want to go back, back to basically Acts, where you just see that there's a church in Corinth. There's not a Presbyterian church in Corinth, a Baptist church in Corinth. Um, so that's really what they're wanting to do. They don't use instruments in music. They consider them as unauthorized innovations. They're against any parachurch groups, and they would call organized mission societies also parachurch groups. But the individual churches are quite active in mission work. They... Although they're part of a grouping, they actually are autonomous churches with little or no interdenominational activities. And as far as I can see, they seem to be quite orthodox in their views of the Bible, Christ, baptism, the Lord's Supper. So that's why I would call them as quite conservative Protestant group. Uh, my only comment would be on their claim that they believe the Bible only, and they don't believe in any additional creeds or statements of faith. I believe that is naive and untrue. In fact, 
you ask them what they believed about the Bible, what they believed about baptism or church government, they would tell you, we believe the Bible teaches this. Um, so they do, in fact, have theological statements about what they believe. They're just not written down. So why does it become unbiblical when you write it down? Um, and so my personal advice is if you go to a church and you ask them, so what do you believe? And the only answer they want to give is, no, we believe the Bible is avoid that church. Um, and I'm not saying that's exactly what they do, but everybody claims to believe the Bible. The Jehovah's Witnesses claims to believe the Bible, the Mormons. A church group must be able to articulate what they believe the Bible teaches. That is fundamental to Christianity, and that's what the Lord Jesus wants us to do. So Hillcrest Baptist, for example, we express ourselves. Here's the 1689 Confession of Faith, which we believe reflects what the Bible teaches. Our authority is the Bible, but we still do have statements. And so um, the Church of Christ do in fact have theological statements, and they'll be able to tell you what they are if you ask them, do they hold to believer's baptism or pedo's baptism, they would tell you and ex explain why. That's a theological statement. And it doesn't mean that it suddenly becomes wrong if you write it down. So I do believe we have to be confessional as churches so that we can tell people what we believe the Bible teaches. Um, yeah. Otherwise, so to answer the question, they seem, seem to be a conservative Protestant um, church. Um, they don't seem to have any wonky doctrine um, around the Bible, Christ, baptism, apart from the skepticism of any written theological statements. Yes? Okay, so I heard that from Billy. Yeah. I went on to websites. They... I went on to people who have reviewed them, and I didn't get any such feedback. So, uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, so just for those people online, we've got some testimonies who've had personal experiences to say that they are close to what we call baptismal regeneration, that you basically have to be baptized in order to be saved. So none of the online stuff reflected that, none of the reviews reflected that, and that might indeed be the case. Yes, Nelly? Okay, so they wouldn't have full-time pastors. Okay. Okay, okay, and that's in the African kind of churches. Okay, I didn't pick that up on the websites either, so I just did some basic research and looked at people reviewing them. Okay, thank you for that. So just for those people online, some of the African Church of Christ's don't believe in pastors. They are what they would call Holy Spirit lead. Randy? Okay. All of them, okay. You probably do get a ver variation, as we know. They're very strongly anti-denominational, with each church being autonomous. So, okay. Thank you so much for those comments.
So I hope those, I think the Majolas asked the question, so I hope that gives you a little bit of insight. Okay. Right, session five tonight, revival and lessons and role of Hillcrest Baptist. So let's jump in to revival. Maybe there are quite a few people who don't realize that we went through a period of wonderful revival in South Africa. And the accounts that you read of that revival is truly amazing. And just it was so uplifting as I read through some of these accounts. So it started off in 1857, 1858 in the USA. Let's face it, all good things start in the USA. Um, where they experienced religious revival, apparently started from noonday prayer meetings um, in New York in a Dutch Reformed church. In a short space of time, more than one million members were added to made the major denominations. That revival, 1857-1858, spread to the British Isles. Um, in 1859, for example, in Northern Ireland, some 10% of the population professed conversion. Um, a journal of the Dutch Reformed Church carried news of the revival to the Cape, to the Dutch Reformed Churches in the Cape, and they asked the churches to pray that the revival would spread. So in 1860, missionaries and ministers in South Africa held a conference at Worcester to hear accounts of the revival, what was happening overseas. There were some 374 delegates and they returned to their churches then in the Cape and a bit further afield with great expectations. Here are some examples of what happened in South Africa. Montague, um, the deputation from Montague instituted prayer meetings in their church. Soon spiritual movement in the Methodist and Dutch Reformed churches, they had prayer meetings every day and every night of the week. Large numbers came to morning prayer meetings. Um, even if they set the time for five o'clock, some people would arrive at three o'clock. Young and old were crying to, uh, to God for mercy during the prayer meetings, during the preaching on a Sunday. Um, there were such large numbers at those prayer meetings that they couldn't fit into many of the church buildings. In Worcester, um, there was a small hall prayer meeting at one of the Dutch Reformed churches, which was led by De Fris, who at that time was a pastor to, uh, was assistant pastor to Andrew Murray. Um, in this particular instance, one of the young Koza uh, girls started to ask to pray, and they said that as they were praying, they heard the sound, what sounded like thunder approaching. The building shook. Um, Andrew Murray heard the noise from the main building and came running in to investigate, um, wanting to know what all the disorder was because people were crying out to God for mercy. Later that week, Andrew Murray himself was leading a prayer meeting, and exactly the same thing happened as they were praying, this sound of thunder coming closer and the building being shaken. Um, during this period, you had many visitors attending churches. The churches were overflowing, many people blessed. During this time especially, you had a lot of members volunteering for missions work. And I think this is what the comment that Keith made. Within 10 years, the Dutch Reformed Church had a dozen mission stations emanating from this revival. Um, in the one congregation, there were 50 men who volunteered themselves, gave up their jobs, and went into missions. And so the revival spread um, in the Cape, Transvaal. Um, there's just a map. I try to list everything. Just Calvinia, Worcester, Swellendam, um, Grahamstown was a big, large area affected by the revival. Even Natal, um, there were... There were um, records of revival, but essentially throughout the whole of South Africa. In Natal, um, they started prayer meetings as well. Um, in one, at one incident, 
There was a chapel and some 300 people fell on their knees and cried for mercy. The Grahamstown district, um, mission at, there were numerous mission stations in that district. Reports of groups of 300, 500, even 800 people coming together and coming to faith. And in that Grahamstown area, in a very short space of time, um, estimates of over 2,000 people coming to faith um, and similar reports throughout South Africa. In the two years of the revival which South Africa experienced, the Methodists, for example, reported a 40% increase in membership. So isn't that amazing and wonderful that God had this land in his heart when the Holy Spirit went out in revival and that we experienced that in our history. I find that really heartwarming. Keep on praying for revival. God has done it before and he can do it again. So, wonderful revival and refreshment from the Holy Spirit. Okay, the second um, section tonight. Just some of the recent trends and issues that are happening in South Africa at the moment, I'd say in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, let's go through some of this. So, post-1994, reconciliation and the, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee was happening. That had an impact on the churches as well. And the churches went through a phase also of reconciliation and a search for unity. For example, just three or four examples. Um, so, the Dutch Reformed Church had two daughter churches, one for black communities and one for colored communities, and those were the Dutch Reformed Missions Church and then the Dutch Reformed Church in Africa. And they, in fact, united, um, and they formed the Uniting Reformed Church. And they have been in talks with the Mother Dutch Reformed Church, or Kerk since 1999. Um, Second example, various branches of the AFM also came together. Um, Africa Faith Mission, the uh, sorry, Apostolic Faith Mission. Um, they were fragmented to a degree, so reconciliation was in the air. The Baptist Union and the Black Baptist Convention started engaging in talks for merging. 1999, the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Southern Africa and the Presbyterian Church in Southern Africa merged to form the Uniting Presbyterian Church of Southern Africa. So post-1994, the spirit of reconciliation that affected South Africa also impacted the church, and they started um, looking to unite. And those are just some examples. Right. Session two was how the denominations formed in South Africa. So how have they fared? So generally speaking, this is in the last 20 to 30 years, these churches have been in decline. Dutch Reformed Church, Methodist, Anglican, Presbyterian, Congregational, and a few others, your what we would call your traditional mainline churches have been in decline. They are losing members. And there's no doubt in my mind that that is an effect of liberalism. You go to most of these mainline traditional churches and you will find liberal doctrine. And I'm going to describe a little bit later just what some of that liberalism is because that is a major trend in South Africa today. But essentially, if you just think about going to a mainline traditional church that is liberal, that would basically doesn't believe the Bible is fully the word of God. Um, as John Frame speaks about it, they believe that there's muck in the Bible somewhere, um, and they don't know how much is there, but that's it's essentially the Bible is does contain error. It's no longer fully authoritative. They often deny the physical resurrection of Christ, saying it was just a spiritual resurrection. So the question would be, 
If you go to one of these, what I would call religious centers, where essentially the gospel has been lost, who wants to give their life to an impotent God, to follow a religious book with a whole lot of muck in it, and follow a Jesus who remains buried somewhere in Israel? Rather join a bowling club, it's much more exciting. Um, there's nothing there to give your life for, is there? It's just basic, um, mostly empty religion. And I believe that always with liberalism, although it professes to be enlightened, and that's what the people want, you will always find in the long term a decline of numbers because they've in fact got nothing to offer people apart from empty religion. I'm sorry to say that. It's sad, but that is, I believe, the truth. How of the Baptists? Well, the Baptists have tend to hold their numbers. No major decline, but no major growth. Amongst Baptists, the Reformed Evangelical Anglican churches, the Nazarenes, the smaller Reformed churches, even the AFM, the Full Gospel and Assemblies of God, recently have shown a decline in their original growth, and they more or less just holding their numbers at the moment. Which churches are growing? Your charismatic churches and your charismatic networks are growing in South Africa still. That's the Christian network, which is that Hatsfield Baptist Church group, um, the IFCC, the International Federation of Christian Churches, which is um, where the Rhema Church is largely playing a leading role in South Africa. His people are, grow are, are growing. Um, uh, churches connected to the Hillsong family, the Vineyard Churches um, are growing. And the Christian Fellowship International, which is part of the Durban Christian Center, are all recording um, growth. And then the African Independent Churches are still growing. Um, at the moment in South Africa. Summary, mainline denominational churches decline, I believe, because of the liberalism that has basically um, only offering people a bit of an empty religion. Um, Baptists, we're not growing, which is sad, but we are not, there's no major loss um, of members. Okay. What are some of the doctrinal issues that are kind of present in South Africa at the moment as dominant issues? The first one is liberalism. In our mainline denominational churches, and I have had, have had numerous personal experiences of this, go to your traditional mainline Anglican, Methodist, congregational churches, you will find... More often than not, liberalism, what is that? It's a denial of the miracles in Scripture, a denial of the physical resurrection, substitutionary atonement is considered barbaric and cruel. Why would God do that to his own son? Um, inerrancy certainly is not found there. There is a questioning of a lot that is in the Bible, they believe it is riddled with errors. The exclusivity of the gospel. Um, two weeks ago, I showed you the quote from Desmond Tutu, um, Archbishop in the Cape Town Synod, which basically says we can't be so arrogant as to insist that people have to become Christians. He knows of people from other religions who are holy on their way to heaven. Um, so that is what uh, uh, eternal damnation as well, very much undermined uh, in liberalism. So that is the, the dominant influence, I believe, in your mainline uh, Protestant churches in South Africa at the moment. Then another big one, as we are aware, key doctrines and issues, sexuality has become a major issue in the world and in the church. So a lot of the mainline denominational churches allow for gay marriage. Your whole issue around LGBTIQ um, pastors. Um, so I'll give you some examples there. 
Um, just look at that in October 2018. The Southern Synod of the Uniting Reformed Church, which I've just we've spoken about a few slides earlier, in Southern Africa, voted to allow clergy to perform same-sex marriages, as well as to ordain openly partnered LGBTIQ ministers. So whatever kind of sexual preference you have, um, and it can change uh, any day of the week if you want to, they um, ordain those ministers. Um, Anglican Church as well, um, people who are openly gay, concentrate, consecrated as bishops, um, and then the quote last uh, two or three weeks ago by Desmond Tutu, Archbishop of Cape Town. So definitely sexuality is um, in the churches and people are very confused about it. Charismatic doctrine, as we saw in South Africa at the moment, the charismatic churches are the, the, what we would call the third wave charismatic churches. Those groups, the Hatfield Group, IFCC, are all growing in South Africa. And what that tells me is that people are looking for something real. Uh, they are looking for encounters with the Lord. The health and wealth gospel, it is not as rife as it used to be in South Africa, but in Southern Africa, health and wealth is still rife. And it is so sad to see in those poor communities where they've got almost nothing. One would think, how could you believe in health and wealth? Um, and the pastor arrives in a limo, and they've walked, the congregation has walked for 20 Ks with no shoes on, and health and wealth is alive and well in southern Africa, and very sad. Ecumenism is still um, a major issue around the world, and in South Africa, Roman Catholic Church and Protestant looking at um, unity, without doctrinal clarity. Um, and as I mentioned last week, the charismatic renewal has formed a major bridge between the two. As I said, if in the Roman Catholic Church people are speaking in tongues and in the Protestant Church people are speaking in tongues, people were saying it's the same spirit. And so, of course, God wants us to unite and let's not worry about our significant doctrinal differences. And then the last one is there is what I would call a very worrying rise of Bible or lack of Bible literacy in the church today. You go to, and I've had just personal experiences of members of different churches, you go to them and they do not know their Bible and they do not have theology. A lot of it is experience-based. And so what you're finding in a lot of the churches is a suspicion of doctrine, and there is certainly theological ignorance um, in a lot of those churches. And it's, theology is seen as division or being divisive, causing division, and also anti-spirit. If you start speaking to them about the Bible and what the Bible teaches, they are not so happy, they're uncomfortable with it, and they feel that you are anti-spirit if you do that. Okay, some lessons for us as we come right near to the end. So these are some of the lessons, and hopefully some of you will also have um, some further insights. So just things that have impacted me as I've prepared for the seminary cafe was just God's grace to us. We're in a period where a lot of people are immigrating from South Africa. God has blessed South Africa. He's not forgotten our land. Um, we have gospel in this land. We have many faithful churches to the Lord. We have religious liberty um, in our land, things that we can praise God and be thankful for rather than complaining about as typical South Africans. So God's rich grace to this land, we praise his name for that. 
just what also struck me is as I was reading the early accounts of history, what brought the gospel to South Africa? It was international commerce and it was war. Those are the things that brought the gospel to South Africa. And so it just it's a reminder for us that in these big events in the world, God uses them in such amazing ways that you would never, ever have thought it would happen. I mean, the Crimean War is what brought a lot of the Baptists um, to South Africa. And that was a war on the other side of the continent, uh, other side of the world for different reasons. The Lord is sovereign. COVID-19, God is doing things through it. This Ukraine-Russian conflict, South African politics, God is establishing his purposes in all of it. And we must be expecting that God is working to build the kingdom of Christ because that is what he has promised he would do. So we need to take courage as we look back on our history to see how the Lord is working in these things that seem calamities at the time. God is not impotent. He is not hands off. He is sovereign over these events. Other big lesson that I think must come out of South African church history is the failure of the church. Um, lessons with the, the Dutch Reformed Church or the Inchia Kerk. You cannot serve two masters, Christ and politics. You've got to choose one, and when you try to serve both, you come unstuck. Many of the white churches during apartheid, as a generalization, I believe, did fail to speak the truth and to um, speak against the government of the day. And then definitely that paternalism, which we spoke about last week, which was one of the main influences that gave rise to the African independent churches, a kind of like superior European or white um, attitude that withheld leadership and control from African people. Fourth one. This is a big one for us. We just have a history of significant hurt and division um, that needs healing. And we, we looked at it, it was the, the English Afrikaans division with the Anglo-Boer Wars, which is still an issue today. Um, African versus kind of white colonial Afrikaans um, divisions, and then also African-African um, divisions with tribalism, but we didn't cover that in the overview today, uh, in, the over in this course. And then number five, we learned some lessons from the Baptist Union, um, specifically for our Baptist grouping in South Africa, starting off the union with incorrect foundations, misunderstanding of confessionalism versus creedalism. A big lesson is that vagueness in doctrine promotes liberalism, and there's definitely an incorrect understanding of liberty of conscience and, conscience and religious freedom. So those, um, I believe, are lessons for us. Okay, last two or three slides. Challenges for Hillcrest Baptist. Where are we? Definitely, we need to be a multiracial, multicultural church. As our demographics around us change, we need to show South Africa how the gospel heals the hurts of our past. They are still there. They are significant. And I have just rejoiced to see some of that healing in this church between English and Afrikaans, um, working with our, our church plants with Nelly and Paulos and Edda Meni, um, just how the Lord has healed us and we're working together, we are one in Christ. There will always be little niggling issues, I guess, as we work together, but um, let's pray that Hillcrest Baptist will be able to display the healing um, as the de demographics change. We want to see more African people um, in this church. And let's pray that God would allow us 
to show South Africa what Christ does in terms of healing. Um, challenges for us is the rapid growth of the African independent churches. Just the need for doctrinal orthodoxy, this is still a rapidly growing group with a lot of it bringing in African tra traditional um, religion coming into the church, which dishonors Christ. And so we must be praying for our, the 1689 exposition in Zulu. Let's pray that God would send it out there for the men who are being trained, that they would be able to influence um, our KZN Zulu nation and that these churches, in fact, will have a revival back to sound, reformed theology. That would be so wonderful. Um, and so that's something we are laboring at, and we need to pray that God would bless that work. And then, just with our church plants and our missionary work, we do have this policy. We need to make sure that we continue with it, that at the end of the day, we are wanting churches to be planted, which are independent, self-governing, indigenous churches with their own culture. Um, obviously, though, we, we teach and we work with our missionaries so that those works are within biblical norms and things like ancestor worship, which is unacceptable, um, cannot be tolerated within that. But, uh, but apart from that, people need to worship in their own culture um, and Leadership should be handed over to qualified indigenous um, leaders as the Lord raises them up. And then the last one from my side is this is really what I feel is a challenge for Hillcrest Baptist to become a vibrant, relevant, spirit-filled reformed church. I believe that is what South Africa needs at the moment um, that our members would have a deep spirituality and zeal, a passion for the reformed faith and God's sovereignty, um, that we do have a missions and outreach focus, discipleship and body life. We maintain a high standard of expository preaching, of prayer, and the preaching that is relevant and challenging. And we need to understand the times in which we live and we need to be making statements about liberalism, gay marriage, um, etc. We need to be updating our, our, st our statements and our standards to show that we are relevant, that we understand the world and the country and the times that we live in, and we proclaim Christ's perspective on those things. Right. So, that is what I have got. It's a bit of a wrap-up of the previous four weeks. And we're now going to have a time of um, questions, hopefully not too many questions, because I doubt whether I've got all the answers, but some comments or insights from yourselves as well. If there is not much, then we'll wrap it up. But we do have a roving mic, and I'll ask Jamie just to get that. If you do have some comments, then please... Uh, don't hog the floor for 10 minutes. Keep them quite short um, and brief. But um, questions, comments, insights, some of the things which I've given over the weeks are certainly my perspectives. You might have a different perspective and you're welcome to, um, to raise that. Just remember we are live and online. So... Um, you are going to go out to the rest of South Africa, potentially. So, late, you had um, your hand. Thanks. You brave man. Let's start with you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, picking up on the multiracial, multicultural uh, ministries, isn't it right for Hillcrest Baptist Church to have ministries for Zulu speaking, for Afrikaans, for English speaking. And I'm talking about home groups in particular. 
where we could have a common English service on Sunday, but that those groups are addressed as well. And my background to that is I spent some six weeks in Singapore 10 years ago, and there is an international Baptist church in Singapore with 52 nationalities. And they have yes. ministries for the Chinese, for the Philippines, for the uh, Malayans, for a whole host of them. And they are all covered. Yet there is one church service in English every Sunday. Yes. And I think this is worthwhile to consider in our situation. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so that is a definite debate in churches as to as to how to um, handle the different cultures. And so without criticizing individual churches, because they do do it differently, I mean, on the one side, you do want to display unity. You don't want to start segmenting your church into the different cultures so that, in effect, they become three or four separate churches. So that would be the challenge um, of, of having that. Um, but yet certainly in places, um, especially in your big um, cities, I mean Singapore would be one of them, but a lot of those churches have got dominant foreign culture groups to the country. And there's a language barrier, um, and so there might cer certainly be place then for if you've got a big Hispanic group and they hardly understand English that you would... Um, let them uh, perhaps have some meetings in their home language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I think we are not we are not there yet at all. And certainly in South Africa at the moment, and in Hillcrest, I think the fact that everybody understands English, um, but certainly there's no reason why we couldn't, um, if we got more Zulu members, we'd have a Zulu song. Um, an Afrikaans song every now and then. Um, yeah, so I think it, one, one has to proceed cautiously so that you don't segment your church into little churches because the world wants to see, I believe, needs to see people of different cultures coming together and being united in one body. And so that, that would be a, da a danger of segmenting your home groups in that way. But um, that's without criticizing churches where they've got big groups of, of dominant cultures, um, but certainly the mix in, in ages, in cultures, I think is, is good and healthy for a church and one wants to keep that um, and not segment it significantly. Thank you. Good comment. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Andrew. Um, just to go back um, and, and recap a little on another issue that I think is important and we underrate today, um, is the issue that the um, communist-based um, liberation influence on the churches, and I think you can see that influence on the mainstream Anglican, um, Methodist, uh, and congregational churches in this country, which have all been in serious decline. And um, there was um, a document um, put out by ANC um, management, if you want to call it that, that said we need to specifically target white churches, to start um, appealing to uh, mercy and, and in the process destroy their doctrines. And that has been an issue. We, we've all seen that. Um, um, various um, primates from various um, churches have been quite outspoken in their views. Um, and of course, we see the problem carrying on today um, with the whole um, cultural Marxism, Black Lives Matter, the whole LGBTQ, PRS, and whatever else they're going to add. Um, 
as well as it's all part of a package. If you are going to be involved in um, climate change, you then have to accept the whole package, which is LGB, uh, yes. Black Lives Matter, um, and all the rest of the nonsense that goes with it. So again, that influence is still there, and it's destroying churches. Um, in America, largely quite terrifying things. George Geddes, I think it is, who is the head of the Southern Baptist Convention, not the seminary, um, is quite pro this stuff. And uh, there's a big hassle over various documents that he has plagiarized and put out using other people's names. So, you know, there, there's a great danger that influence is still there. It's yes. still working. Okay. So definitely, when you look at what happened in the churches and with the transition to a democratic South Africa, liberation theology was quite big as a, a dominant influencer um, in the church. So definitely, obviously, we know from South American origins, etc. cetera. Um, and for those of you who don't know, liberation theology tends to... Well, in answering the question, so why did Christ come to earth? It was to liberate the poor and to save the poor as opposed to save us from sin. So essentially then, the liberation theology places the dominant emphasis of Christianity and the cross on the liberation of the oppressed as opposed to liberation from sin and peace with God. And that certainly was a, a dominant influence at that time and is still in quite a few, um, I think especially the Anglican Church, um, you definitely see some of that liberation theology still there and I believe goes hand in hand with the liberalism. Um, so, yeah, certainly. I mean, so, so as a church, in terms of understanding the times, um, we want to show the love of Christ to the world, but yet display Christ's standards and judgments to that world. And definitely that's going to be a tricky one to navigate. It's going to become more and more difficult for churches who will not marry, will not recognize gay marriage as valid. Um, the pressure is going to be on those types of churches internationally, and there's no doubt in South Africa as well, They're coming up. So we do need to brace ourselves to be not judgmental in a harsh way, but to be firm on the gospel and on Christ's standards and what is biblical, and to accept the consequences that are going to come with that, and there will be consequences. Yes, we should we should we, sh we should start a, a prisoner's ministry now, <laughs> in case some of us go there. They need to be beneficiaries of it. Um, yes, but gratefully, still have religious liberty. Um, the movement is definitely to tighten up against groups who will not recognise gay marriage, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as valid. Um, alternate sexualities as valid um, and essentially we have to remain faithful to God and scriptures and while still showing the love of Christ to people and not judging them in that in the, in a judgmental way but still saying this we love you but this is what Christ says and this is what the gospel says Yes, anything else? Okay, can I just also then ask that if you do have um, further insights or comments, uh, maybe things that you believe I was off track with, please email them to me, um, just in case I run the seminary cafe again or somewhere else. Um, I'd always want to be improving and including other people's insights. Just to thank um, once again Mindy, Frankie, Jonathan and everybody else who helped 
um, with the Seminary Cafe. Deeply appreciate it, and thank you for coming. I got quite a few apologies tonight, and I thought it might only be two or three people. So thank you for coming out. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for this land, a land of contrasts, a land of deep division and conflict, a land with a history of oppression and racism, and you have placed us here at this time and in this place to be your ambassadors, to preach the gospel and the message of reconciliation with you and of liberty from enslavement to sin. And so we would pray that you would keep us faithful as a church. We would pray for the, the church in South Africa that there might be revival, Lord, that you would stretch out your hand and your spirit again to hasten the kingdom of Christ, to draw sinners to yourself, that there might be a revival in sound doctrine, in a right understanding of you, a revival in returning to the authority of your word, so we would lift up ourselves and the church in South Africa and ask that you might bless us and have mercy on us. You would correct that which is wrong and you would prosper and grow that which is right. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.